Now, routinely, you'll hear journalists talking about public concern about a particular issue. But how do journalists know this? Is it more the case that they're talking about media concern on this issue? Pablo Boczkowski is co-author of The News Gap, when the media preferences of the media and the public diverge. Pablo, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Sean. Uh, tell us, uh, d- or describe to us, the particular study that you carried out. So my co-author and I studied uh, the difference between the stories that journalists in leading media organizations such as you know, The Guardian or The Times of London, CNN, and so on and so forth, consider to be the most newsworthy ones, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, st- the stories that consumers, users, the public of these sites, consider to be the most important uh, or interesting one as measured by which are the stories that they, um, on which they click uh, most often. Now, uh, d- did the results vary depending what was going on in the world I- in the sense of whether the, uh, what, what the journalists considered the most interesting and what the public considered the most interesting? Did those two things ever coincide? So normally they do not. Uh, journalists tend to prioritize stories about public affairs matters, that is, uh, politics, international news, business, economics. And the public tends to gravitate towards issues such as sports, weather, crime, entertainment. That is under normal circumstances. However, when there are major political events such as a national election, then the, this gap in the interest of the media and the public narrows. In some cases, it disappears. In some others, it stays the same. But there is a difference that politic, politics makes in sort of you know, concentrating the attention of the public. So it, 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 you can see why, uh, uh, w- when it's a centre stage, that people would be more interested in politics. So, that, but that does does that mean then that most of the time, what a journalist considers to be the most interesting interesting story of the day isn't what his or her readers consider the most interesting story of the day. That is indeed correct. Uh, for the most part, uh, you know, when we are talking about the leading media organisations, the media organisations that set the agenda in their respective countries. Uh, journalists who work for these uh, media organizations and their editors tend to prioritize stories about, say, politics or an international crisis or a major fiscal issue, uh, whereas uh, the public tends to gravitate towards soccer, which is highly prevalent in the UK, for instance, Mm -hmm. or uh, weather disasters or, you know, celebrity news then that means actually the opposite, that those major news organizations aren't setting the agenda. They just think they are. Correct. They are setting the agenda for what we can call the elite public, the decision makers in business, governments, and the non-profit sector who uh, still follow this news and consume this news very attentively. But for the mass public, they are not setting the agenda by and large. You are correct. Uh, does that, do you think, have, uh, or will it have, uh, uh, will there be ab- economic implica- implications for this, particularly in the digital age where people don't have to uh, go on to the Guardian website or the New York Times website to find their news if they, are, if they are starting to find increasingly that what the New York Times says is the important story of the day isn't what they're interested in? You're absolutely right. Uh, what we found is that this gap is fairly uh, large in terms of size and quite consistent. And, you know, using common sense, we know that no business can survive by having, you know, a gap between supply and demand. That is, by offering a number of goods that get unsold uh, within a given cycle. So if 20% or so of the tutorial offer of these sites is not consistent with what the, the public wants to read about. Uh, potentially, that means a waste of resources for these organizations. And given that most of them are hurting financially, uh, this could have significant economic implications in the short to medium term future. Does that also, though, beg the question of, of presenting journalism as, as a product like any other product that one sells? Correct. You are absolutely right. The, journalism is and is not a product like any other product. Um, what happened during most of the 20th century was that the leading media organizations in print, in television, in radio, had such a strong market position that they were de facto like utilities companies. That is, they were the only one, two, or three shows in town. So advertisers had to go to them 
uh, to you know sell their products to the uh, large audiences. So news organizations could provide audiences with important stories, despite the fact that the audiences might not want to read about them. Mm. Um, so in a sense, they always were a product, but uh, the strong market position of leading media enabled them to carry on the public service mission of journalism. However, in this day and age, in a much more competitive uh, environment, especially you know, with the introduction of digital media a couple of decades ago, um, news organizations cannot probably afford to ignore the preferences of the audiences as they have had done in the past. That then, in turn, in turn, is bound to have an effect, one would imagine, upon how democracies will function in the future. Because generally speaking, in the Western world, voting rates are going down. People are people who aren't interested in politics aren't even forced to address the existence of politics, and therefore they're leaving it to other people to make all those decisions. You are again right. There is a relationship between being informed about political issues, deliberating about them and participating in political and civic life. If news organizations feel more and more the need to give the public what the public wants, despite the fact that it might not be good for them, uh, we might see more and more soccer, less and less politics, and less and less of an informed public, and as you said, less public deliberation and less political participation. That's a kind of a scary thought. Is there, is, there any, or is there any clue as to how one might reverse this trend? Well, no, there are a number of experiments, none of which seem particularly promising at the time. But I think it's important to keep in mind that we live in a transition, in a historical transition. And if, you know, if we know something about transitions in other moments in history, is that from the vantage point of the present, it's very hard to foresee the future. So what I think, therefore, is important now is to be mindful of these trends and to tinker with a wide array of possible ways out of it. Anything from philanthropy like ProPublica uh, in the U.S. or the decision, the recent decision by the eBay founder uh, to put $250 million behind uh, investigative journalism and, you know, a, a new website to mm-hmm. hyperlocal uh, news developments. Uh, that might provide part of the answer. But so far, um, none of the experiments that have been tried have had enough traction to constitute a viable alternative. That would say, uh, and so therefore it would seem as if, you know, that kind of news, uh, the kind of news as, as the likes of The Guardian and The New York Times uh, would deem to be important, will be increasingly just a province of an elite and there'll be the large bulk of the of a popula- of populations looking at this elite saying well they're uh, they're retaining all the power and prestige for themselves and that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy yes we might see more and more separation uh, among different sectors of society you are absolutely right it is possible it is also possible that uh, you know the public uh, at large is informing themselves through headlines, uh, you know, or Twitter feeds and things like that, uh, or regarding political news, and then clicking on, you know, the latest Manchester United uh, story. Um, the question then is, can an informed polity function on 140 characters? You know, the stock market recently thinks that, you know, that is indeed the case, and therefore the money is on Twitter, uh, as not only as a company, but also as a metaphor of how information is produced and circulates in society these days. But that is a question that begs further exploration. Pablo, thank you very much for speaking with us today. That's uh, Pablo J. Boczkowski. The name of the book he's co-author of is The News Gap, when the information preferences of the media and the public diverge. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with the news.